on TV, on radio, and on your smartphone. This is Talk TV. Tonight on Piers Morgan Uncensored, Britain's economy is in the gutter. Even Russia will grow faster than us this year. Three years on today from Brexit, is that dream turning into a nightmare? We'll debate. Plus, a top US general criticises the British Army amid dire warnings of an ammunition shortage and a nuclear submarine fixed with superglue. So is Britain still a top military power? We'll hear from our Defence Secretary and one of our great generals. Plus, Donald Trump vows to ban schools from teaching children about gender ideology as a landmark court case brings that ferocious debate to Britain. So how young is too young for children to learn about things like gender and sex? Live from London, this is Piers Morgan Uncensored. Well, good evening from London. Welcome to Piers Morgan Uncensored. Nothing in living memory has done more to divide this country and define our politics than Brexit. I didn't support it, but frankly, I do understand why 17 and a half million people did. It wasn't, as the critics said, about bigotry, racism or hate in the most part. It was about rolling the dice and striving for something better, as they saw it, for our freedom and independence. Project Fear warned the British people that their lives and their country would collapse if they dared to gamble on the unknown. And as with Donald Trump in the US, many people answered back by saying the status quo wasn't good enough anyway. The people promising the apocalypse were the same people who promised to make our lives infinitely better for years and failed. But exactly three years on, it's time for some cold, hard truths. The promises made pro-Brexit have also been broken. is about democracy. Is it not time we took back control of our immigration policy? Take back control of the £350 million pounds that we send to the European Union every week. The free trade agreement should be one of the easiest in human history. The UK has voted to leave the European Union. Let June the 23rd go down in our history as our Independence Day. Brexit means Brexit, and we are going to make a success of it. We've got an oven-ready deal, put it in the microwave. Anybody turn that microwave on? <laughs> Today, the IMF said that the UK economy will shrink this year. It will be worse off than any other significant economy, including Russia. Think about that a nation pounded by sanctions, locked out of the global banking system, cast aside as the world's pariah, will grow faster than we will in the UK. Britain's the only G7 economy that will actually shrink this year. That's the forecast. The US, Canada, France, Germany, Italy, Japan, they all had COVID lockdowns. They're all battling the same cost-living crisis caused by Putin's war. So why are we worse off? Well, Bloomberg said today that Brexit's cost of the UK economy £100 billion a year. The economy is 4% smaller than it would have been, but it never happened, they say. So where are the benefits? That's my big question. Vote Leave promised £350 million a week for the NHS. Well, the NHS is on its knees. Brexiteers said we'd take back control of our borders. Well, that's not happening. Immigration's rising. The borders are in chaos. Many industries are short of workers. Ask anyone in hospitality. They said we'd strike lucrative trade deals across the world, not least with the US. Well, we haven't, have we? Disarray over Northern Ireland, anger in Scotland, attesting the very existence of the United Kingdom. Britain, frankly, feels like a bit of a basket case, lurching from shambles to chaos. Maybe that's why a staggering new poll published by Unheard shows that 647 of the 650 UK constituencies now think Brexit was a mistake. Having voted for Remain, I backed Brexit in the end because I believe in democracy and the will of the people. I didn't back the principle of it. I just backed the principle of you give the people of the country what they voted for, and the majority voted to leave the European Union. But the will of the people may now be changing. Well, joining me now, political journalist Ava Santina, Talk TV presenter Richard Tice, lawyer and activist Gina Miller, who took the government to court over the Brexit process and won twice, and the founder of the Black Farmer and Brexit backer, Wilfred Emmanuel Jones. So welcome to all of you. Richard Tice. Here's my problem with Brexit. I wanted it to work. Didn't vote for it. Wasn't completely sure, if I'm honest. It was a complex debate. 
uh, understood a bit of both sides, but in the end voted Remain. Once I knew my, my side had lost, I voted for democracy. Yep. I voted actually for Boris Johnson's Conservative Party because they were the only party in that election that said they would honour the result of the referendum. And I thought that was more important than anything else. But as we sit here three years on from it actually coming into, into fruition, I'm really struggling to see any of the benefits that we were promised. And in fact, all I'm seeing is the opposite. That it's become a millstone around this country's no, hang, neck. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Right. Great intro, lovely. But look, the first major benefit... Am I wrong? Is, no, you're completely wrong. Um, but the first major benefit was the vaccine rollout. Literally, Brexit saved lives because we Sorry, ordered the vaccines. It's that the truth, the Gina. You know it. No, no other it's EU a country. Lie. Can we please but let's put move this on. Lie. No, 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 Gina. It's the truth. No other bed. EU country. No, okay, wait a minute. Order the vaccine. Time out. Time out. Time out. Time out. Can I explain why it's not true? Well, time out. Let no. him. Can I explain? Why okay, here's how. Here's how. Time out. It's not true. I'm lying. I was even faster than I thought. It's not true. Okay, wait a minute. Here's what we're going to do. Let Richard say what he thinks happened. OK, on and the then, vaccines. And then, on the vaccines, okay. then you can immediately respond. Yes, and by the way, I do know what happened. It'll be very interesting how this plays out. Richard. So, on the vaccines, we were able to order the vaccines early because we made the decision not to join the EU's own vaccine acquisition. Whereas some of the other countries, like Germany, like the Netherlands, they wanted to do, order their own vaccines and they were stopped by Brussels. That's what happens on Gina, the vaccines. respond. That's not true for three reasons. One is we were in the transition period so we were still under EU law. Secondly, no country, not even us or existing members, had to join the joint scheme that was not part of the, uh, of the agreement. The reason they did was not for sovereignty and was not for law. The EU countries decided for technical and medical reasons not to actually jointly roll out vaccines and not to go the route we did. It had nothing to do with sovereignty and it had nothing to do with law. Funny, isn't it? And it had nothing to do... I'm sorry, it's the truth. We were under EU law at the time. We were in the transition And who period. ended up with the fastest vaccine? The but UK did it, save lives, Brexit slave lives. But look, the reality is... No, no, no on, that's well, we've done true, the but that was not because of Brexit. That's the lie. Funny, isn't it? it How all the other EU 27, of... they all had their own... Uh, acquisition but we could have done it without right. being in the EU. Hang on, it's hang on. A lie. Ava, Ava. No, but just the fact is we didn't need to be in the EU. Yes. We could have done it exactly the same but way. But we but wouldn't look, have done. None of the is, other countries did. The problem did. with the Brexit discussion is that your, your argument is steeped in ideology, and it's steeped in an ideology that harks back from 1950. And the problem with 1950 oh, is that we had the empire, and we were able to pillage other countries, and we were, Ava we were able, we were able to take labour in from other countries. Sovereignty. But nowadays, but nowadays, we have to go and entice people to come and work here. And our services do not function if we can't bring people in what about from the getting EU. Our own, what about getting our own people to work? We've got five million people. I hate that. It's such benefits. a silly argument. It's not. It's, it's absolutely such a right. silly argument. Look after your own people How are first. you going to train One people to work in the NHS right now, right now, when we can't fill Ma vacancies? What, what, there is not a by the way, happen? there is not a restaurant owner Correct. in the country who won't tell you that Brexit has been a disaster but, for recruiting but staff just, and just, holding but, staff. But hang on, Piers, we've just had record lawful immigration of over a million people last year. We haven't got a people shortage, we've got a willing worker shortage because we, we are deficit. truly highly taxed in this country. Immigration what the Tories deficit. have utterly failed to do, if you're going to do a job, do it give me two other benefits of Brexit. Quickly. We should have cut taxes. No, we give me two other benefits. Other daft There's EU two regulations. other benefits of having... They haven't done this. There's so that lawnmower tax. So when you say... OK, so hang the on. The good news is so we've still hang got on. the platform right, hang of opportunity. On. Hang on. You can't, on the one hand, say that my monologue was very eloquent but completely wrong when I say, where are the benefits of Brexit? And then when I pin you to the ground and say, well, what are these benefits? You say, well, they haven't happened yet. Because they haven't taken advantage of the So I'm right, then. I'm not wrong. I'm right. Look, the point there is... There have been no discernible benefits. So far, but the opportunity is still there. So how can you there say I'm no completely plan. wrong? I don't, what I said was... I'm actually completely right. No, the point is that the it's country... It's a bit like that picture of Prince Andrew <laughs> in the bar for telling no, no, no. to <laughs> prove that he couldn't have got up to anything in the bar. All no. it did was prove the opposite. But you're then saying, after three years, therefore that means we should stop and we should... Go no, back. no, no. What you should do... No, no, that's no, what no, you infer. No, nobody's if you're saying Here's what I'm asking. Here's what I'm asking. Do you know what? I want you to come in here. Here's what I'm asking. At what point... If we do not see discernible benefits, and we see a lot of negatives... What are the what, negatives? Well, a lot of negatives, and Gina will explain them in a moment. But at what point do we as a country, if it looks more and more like an act of self-harm, do we at the very least consider going back to the country and asking the country what they think? Because if that unheard mm -hmm. map looks right, then that looks like a lot of people are having buyer's remorse. No, I, I don't agree with you on that. Okay. I think that it was so destructive... Where we are at the moment is that we have to limit the damages being done.
Because the idea, some people say that we could actually, it will get better in 10, 15, 20, whenever it is, years. That's not going to help people now who are suffering. That's not going to help people who are using food banks. So no, no, no second no, referendum. No, no second referendum. But all the tools... Period to end, it, right? No. Not... not a, what we need to do is fix the deal we have. And actually, forget about single market going back in, renegotiating any other deal. Everything we have to do is already in the existing agreements that we signed. Both sides signed up to the Trade and Cooperation Agreement and the Northern Ireland Protocol. Both of those bills, uh, those acts and treaties and agreements are international, actually have but clauses in them that could fix the things that are not working. But the problem is there's no political will on any party at the moment to go back. Let's All the clauses are there. We've just, no, wanna, okay, me, right. We've just published a pub, a, an opinion from two of the leading lawyers in the EU called Addressing Brexit Problems. It's on our True and Fair Party website. It says exactly the clauses and how you can fix this. OK, so your, your, is your view, then, that Brexit could work if they fix all the clauses? No, what I'm saying is we have to go sector by sector around the country. But do you think it could Ask still them. work, Brexit? We have no choice. Well, we have a choice. What's the choice? No. Well, well, listen, we had a choice because in the space of 40 years, we made one choice and then made the opposite choice. Yeah, the EU are not going to let us back in. Look, and it takes about 40 look, years to ask you Well, actually, I'm not so, I'm not so sure well, about that. Let well, me, let me bring in, I want to bring in the man who hasn't spoken yet. We've been waiting very patiently. So Wilfred Emmanuel Jones, the black farmer from Chip, Chippenham. You've been listening to this, Wilfred. You were, I think you, you voted Brexit. You've been a, a, a staunch supporter of it. Yeah. But how are you feeling today, three years on, from it coming into play, uh, uh, given all the negative vibes okay. about Brexit now? Paul Richard has been being given a bit of a kicking. But he I just it, think, look, I mean, any he change... He wipe out my entire it, monologue and then... No, he doesn't. No, 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 he does, no, no, he doesn't deserve it because I think what everybody's forgetting, any change involves pain. Those of us who were Brexiteers, we cannot stand here and say, actually, we are now at this particular moment seeing the benefit. It does not mean that in another five, ten years we will then see the benefit. Is that anything is going to actually determine uh, some having some faith that the decision we made three years ago will pay off? But sometimes, and the reason okay, why but sometimes, we're struggling Wilfred, at the sometimes, moment is, sometimes now, the strongest thing a country can do or leaders can do is just admit when they got something wrong. Yeah. You know, we don't have, they don't have to be demonised for but it. We don't, we don't have to no, demonise people who voted for Brexit. Peers, peers, but not, what, my, my question really is, peers. this clock, is it open-ended? Does it go on forever? If in 10 years' time no, Brexit no, has been a demonstrable peers, disaster, peers, do, we, do we just carry on? Piers, let me talk. Yes, Piers, Wilfred. What I'm saying is that it's unfair, to, it's unfair to judge people three years in. I think that really? we were having this conversation in five, ten years' time. Oh, yes, really. Because we don't really have the freedom yet that we actually voted for. If we cannot even sort out the, uh, the, well, the, the well, immigration well, problem we've because had, of all the restrictions... We've, actually, five or ten we've actually had, I would say, about eight years, right? Because we had a year before the referendum mm. to get our ducks in a row about what Brexit would look like. The referendum happened in 2016. It's now 2023. <laughs> It's not three years, is it? It's eight years yes. we've had. And no, so but, but, over but, but, an eight-year period, we now have to accept as we sit here, nothing's working. Even Richard Tyson no, loves no, it. Piss, no, but one, 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 one of the yeah, problems... Yeah, but that's got nothing to do with Brexit. It's because of the energy crisis, it's because of the inflation. Yeah. Oh, that's ridiculous. Right? That's, that's not, got nothing to do with Brexit. That is Brexit. not what exactly. people tell me in sharp end. Come on, Piers, you know that. I think don't confuse me. I will not be disingenuous and say I don't think they're all contributing factors. It's one But I also know that there are specific issues about Brexit which people will tell me who run restaurants and bars and all these things, they all say that Brexit has been a massive problem for them with staff. All of them say the same thing. There's two other things that Brexit has done. One is it has caused a labour shortage. Yes, we might get to somewhere where we get... We just had record get... immigration yes, last year. But it we can't not... be a labour shortage. It's a willing... Worker also shortage record because of the people high leave. No, taxes it's because, the country is facing. No, because we've the never people had more we've got, popular people yeah, in this We've country. had more than a million people. It's the highest immigration. I know that. Right. I know the so figures. you just agreed with me. No, Piers I haven't. Hasn't excuse quite me. Yet agreed with me. But I, I think haven't you will. agreed with you on that. What I've said is they're not the people we need. Who are the people? Oh, so the, in the wrong million. sort of people have come into the yes, country. Yes, they are the people who left, who are not picking fruit, who are not working the care service, who've left the NHS. We have who are not in hospitality. Every area is suffering. But the thing that I get so upset about in all of this is that Wilfred says, you know, five, ten years. What about the businesses that are going to go under in that time? Right. What about the people who are going to die because there's nobody to care for them in the community? What about the children who have no teachers? 
This we can't wait to fix these Why things until five, ten years. Why can't we train our own people? Years. What about and the five million time. people? That's not a bad idea, but it will it's take time. It's a great time. idea. Look but after the British time. people. Be oh, Richard, realistic. is there a moment with be Brexit? Realistic. Is there a moment for you where, if it demonstrably has not worked, you would say, it's, "Okay, it hasn't worked." No, because look, or is it just never ending? Let me repeat what I just said, Piers. The challenges the country is facing in terms of high energy prices. Yeah. High taxes, all those, yeah. high cost of you has got nothing whatsoever to do with Brexit. You are deliberately conflating and confusing the two to suit your own argument. No, and let me just no, remind I, you. No, hang on. Let me just hang remind on, you. Hang on. The NHS hang on. Had, I would never ar- had such I would argue, levels of funding. I would argue okay. those IMF numbers today make the it... The IMF, the, the, the worst forecast. OK, but if you take the numbers at face value today, what they show is that we are underperforming a number of other senior countries in the G7, who all faced the same challenges, all faced COVID, all faced a war in Ukraine, the common theme for them is that none of them had the additional problem of Brexit, which may explain why we are currently bottom you, of the class. You're Ava, just agreeing Ava, with Ava, me. Ava, Yeah, I, I just think it's obvious, isn't it? If you don't have trading links, where you suddenly... We have got trading links. We've no, got a trade deal. You, We've got... Uh, Where's the American you, trade Richard, deal? Richard, we it, haven't got an American trade deal. We're nowhere near it. Hang on, but Piers, who have we got the biggest trading surplus with? The United States, right? Right. We've, we've got, we've got, we've got trade 70 deal trade deals. We've got we don't 70 trade deals. Well, it's with, our biggest with, surplus. With it's our biggest single have you trading read about partner. Steel? I mean, we, we have, have you read about our trading with the surplus? US. Wow. And we've to... got a big trading surplus with them. Which we have to pay for. That costs businesses you do an extortionate that our, our goods amount. And exports have increased by 16% since the end of the transition period. Mm-hmm. Ramoners and Remainers. Don't like to talk All right. about well, it. Let me bring in Wilfred. Help anybody. Let me bring in Wilfred. It's the truth. Let me ask Wilfred specifically. No, we haven't. We've Wilfred, are there any farmers that you've come across who genuinely believe Brexit has been brilliant for their business? At the moment, most people will tell you that Brexit has not been good for their business. Okay. Right. okay. But you don't make decisions case. based on how. But hold on. But you. But, but but hold on. But you do not make decisions based on the pain that you're feeling today. It's about having faith that the decision that we made three years ago, in the long term, is going to be a benefit. We well, are we made investing the decision in a our lot longer future. than three years ago. So, that's my point. We made the decision in 2016. It actually only came into reality yeah, but it takes three years more, ago. It, but, yeah, but we've had eight years it, it, to get it, this it right. Takes, it's not it, a three-year it, thing, it, is it? No, no, no. You, you're going back to your thing about sort of eight years ago. I don't think it's a small ago. thing. I just but think the other thing, Gina, final so word to you. The other well, thing that, that Brexit has done is that people don't want to invest in our country because we're not seen as a stable, credible political system, mm. that we can't deal with crisis, and that's why we're not getting inward investment, and that's going to affect growth and people's well, confidence and credibility. Well, it doesn't help when you had, you had the farce of Liz Truss... And that's just, what I'm saying. So, so I think Brexit is exposed... because we're raising taxes when we should be cutting them. We should be going for because growth. Because that we're not well, this oh, trust yeah. is not all that. No, yeah. you've got to cut. You've got to cut business taxes. We have not got a credible country. People don't believe in us. They don't have confidence in us. Right. That's our point. It's, it's one of the right reasons way. that Rishi Sunak is slightly hesitant about that, is that he campaigned on not doing that against Liz Truss. She campaigned on being the fairy godmother, cutting everyone's taxes, and the whole thing was a complete disaster. Because she disaster. didn't say how she was going to fund it. Of course, if you're going right. to cut taxes and go for growth, you say how are you going to fund it. Got to leave it there. Gina, thank you. We're losing you. We appreciate it. Wilfred, thank you. We're losing you. Fortunately, we're keeping Richard Dice, <laughs> who's very fired up this evening. So we'll get him on this. And maybe you're staying around as well. Next tonight, a top US general warns the British Army is no longer a top-level fighting force. Is he right? Should we send Richard Dice, perhaps, to any front line right now? We'll debate with the former head of the British Army, Lord Dannett, next.
Next to come, Donald Trump running for president again wants to ban gender ideology being taught in schools. And this week, a South London primary school is in court letting the kids participate in a pride gay parade. It's a debate raging here and in the US. How young is too young to be taught about issues like trans, gender identity and gay sex? We'll debate all that. First, a worrying warning from a senior US general this week who claims the British Army isn't fit for purpose and may not be able to protect the UK from Russian aggression. Is he right? Well, Ava and Richard are still with me. I'm delighted to be joined by the former head of the British Army, Lord Dunnett. Lord Dunnett, uh, great to see you. Uh, happy 2023. It's our first encounter of the new year. Uh, pretty sobering reading this. I have to say, uh, as someone who's had family in the military in recent years myself, to see the British Army described in that way was a bit disconcerting. What were your thoughts? Well, the um, anonymous American general isn't actually far wide of the mark, as Ben Wallace and James Heapy, the Minister of State for the Armed Forces, um, have both acknowledged. I mean, the fact of the matter is that the army has received the lowest priority in terms of Ministry of Defence spending for the last 10 to 15 years. Um, huge uh, history of underinvestment. So therefore, it's not surprising that our capability is not what we would wish it to be. It's a matter of government choice. It's a matter of Ministry of Defence choice. And then eventually, when push comes to shove, you have to deal with the consequences. But, you know, if, as long as the position is now being realised, there is a chance for Ben Wallace to argue the case for greater resources for defence to try and up the investment as quickly as possible. What did you make of Boris Johnson saying that Vladimir Putin had basically threatened him with a missile? Um, interesting, Piers. Um, I've heard Boris say quite a lot of things um, over the years. Um, whether he misheard that on the telephone call with Vladimir Putin, I don't know. Um, I mean, the fact of the matter is that um, there is an accepted international code of conduct with, between international leaders that they don't take each other out. So um, I think we take that half seriously and half with a pinch of salt. Um, it was a good Boris line. It caught a good headline. And um, I think let's just move on. Are you suggesting that our recently dearly beloved departed Prime Minister can't be entirely relied upon when it comes to veracity of his rhetoric? Oh, I wouldn't suggest that, Piers. But what I would say is that um, it was quite colourful. It was very Boris. And um, I I'm sure it was rooted in a grain of truth, but um, it may have been slightly uh, over-exemplified to catch the headlines, which it duly did. We're now at a crucial stage in this war in Ukraine, um, coming up to the first anniversary. Isabel Oakshaw, our international editor at uh, Talk TV, she interviewed Ben Wallace, Defence Secretary. And we've got this particular clip to play to you, if you just want to uh, listen to this. Sure. How seriously do you take the threat that he might use tactical nuclear weapons? Well, it, it is always a serious threat simply because it is in Russian doctrine. Yeah. They have a, an acceptable view that... You, you can have such a thing as a strategic nuclear weapon and a tactical nuclear weapon. Yes. And their idea of a tactical nuclear weapon can be ten times the size of Hiroshima. I mean, that's, a, again, a sobering statement for the Defence Secretary to make. Um, what is the likelihood or possibility well, that a cornered Vladimir Putin, if he feels like he is losing this war, with all the dishonour that would then be heaped on him back home, that he might be tempted to utilise what is still the biggest nuclear force in the world? Well, appears. let's just put Ben Wallace's comment into context. Um, if a tactical nuclear weapon was ten times the ferocity of Hiroshima and unleashed on Ukraine, Ukraine would then join Pluto and Mars somewhere in the stratosphere. I mean, that's just not going to happen. If we're talking about genuine tactical nuclear weapons, we're talking about a nuclear weapon which could cause destruction and damage over, say, a three to five kilometre area. Now, how could that be employed? Let's just go back to last autumn when the Ukrainians mounted a very successful counteroffensive around Kharkiv and they broke through the Russian lines. That is the moment that if you're desperate, you then consider using a tactical nuclear weapon. But just think about this one for a moment. Those four provinces into which the Ukrainians are now counterattacking those four provinces were declared by Putin to be forever Russia. So here's the question. Why would Putin want to irradiate for the next 50 years some territory that he's declared forever Russia? It just doesn't stack up. Should the Ukrainians give one inch 
of any of their territory, uh, including Crimea, which was seized from them illegally in 2014, and all the latest geographic grabs that Putin's made, should they cede any of this in any kind of deal? Because they seem very determined not to. Uh, no, I think the, um, the whole thing about this conflict now is that there is no basis for a resolution <clears throat> through negotiation. Uh, Zelensky's position is quite clear that every inch, every kilometre of Ukrainian sovereign territory should be Ukrainian. Putin, on the other hand, has got to show something that he has gained out of the war. He's got to gain some part of Ukrainian territory. So their positions are irreconcilable. Therefore, you have to come back to the conclusion that the only way this conflict is going to be resolved is on the battlefield, which is why it's really important that we have continued to supply Ukraine not only with weapons so they don't lose the war, but to give them the chance in a counteroffensive later this year to win this war. And can That's they win possible. it, General? Can they win it? <clears throat> Well, <clears throat> I don't know what's going to happen, but I would hazard that from all the evidence that we're seeing, the Russians having mobilised a lot of additional soldiers, 100, 150,000, maybe 200, poorly trained, poorly equipped, very poorly led and terribly motivated, may well launch a, a new offensive. On the evidence of all that we've seen since the 24th of February, that offensive will fail in a very bloody way with a lot of Russian families having tragedies on their doorstep. At that point... The Ukrainians need to launch a counteroffensive with the additional weapons that we have given them and the training we've given them with their determination to fight for their own country. And they could strike a number of successive blows which could break the morale of the Russian soldier and the backbone of the Russian army. Then it's game over for Putin, game over for Russia, and we're in a whole new ballgame. Finally, if Rishi Sunak is watching this, and I'm sure he will be, um, I'm sure he's an avid viewer of Piers Morgan Uncensored. If not, he should be, Prime Minister. Um, if he is, what is your message to him about our own armed forces and what he should be doing to bolster them? Well, the thing about our own armed forces is, notwithstanding what the American general said, rubbishing our army, our army is made up of fantastic people who are well-led and well-motivated, but they've got pretty old and pretty equipment, not across the, across the piece, but in many areas. The thing is that the army has had the lowest priority in defence spending for quite some years. So two things have got to happen, one or the other. Either priorities in the Ministry of Defence have got to change to up the priority of the army and allocate more money to the army, our land forces. Let's face it, there's a land war going on in Europe that actually makes the case. Or otherwise, Ben Wallace has got to argue the toss with Rishi Sunak and Jeremy Hunt that the defence budget has got to go up from 2% of GDP to 25 that Boris was talking about to 3% that Liz Truss was talking about. But currently it's pinned back to 2%. Actually, I think there's a very strong case to say with a land war in Europe threatening the security of Europe, threatening our security, that actually the defence spend should go up from 2% to at least 2.5% and a fair amount of that extra spend be sent on renewing, refurbishing, um, bringing up to the 21st century our land warfare capability. I just thought of another final question, actually, while I've got you, because I haven't heard you react yet to the revelations in Prince Harry's book that he killed 25 <laughs> Taliban. I wondered, and since you obviously knew Harry quite well and were the head of the British Army at the time this was all going on, what your reaction was to, to him saying that? Well, Piers, it's a great question, and I, I thought you probably would ask it, but I'm afraid I'm going to say what I've said about 50 times to other people who have asked me to comment. I'm not commenting on any of the Prince Harry stuff. So, uh, Piers, um, good question, well asked. No answer from Dan Ed. You're showing an admirable discretion. If only young Harry would do the same, Lord Dan Ed. Great to talk to you. Thanks, Piers. <laughs> Quick reaction from the pack. Uh, I could interview General Dan Ed for hours. He's such a smart guy, but your reaction to what he said there? So the, 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 the difficulty is when he thinks that, that Russia may essentially lose on the battlefield, but I can't see Putin surrendering. And this is why I'm so worried mm -hmm. about we end up in a, a forever war where he just keeps sending bombs and shells, just flattening the place more and more in a sort of long-term blitzkrieg, which is all just awful. Which is his way, right, Ava? I mean, this is what he's done throughout his tenure. This is how he grinds people down and he hopes we all get bored and move on. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, that was incredibly sobering listening to that. Yeah. But I think there's one really important thing that Guy Hofstad said, actually, which is that 
Putin may not have even invaded Ukraine had Europe yeah, not been in political chaos. And so that might be an argument In fact, he said, uh, he said only yesterday, didn't he? He said that he thought that within five years, it's feasible that both the UK would return to the EU and Ukraine would also mm -hmm. come back. In. Absolutely. Uh, I, I, it's got nothing to do with the EU. What it's all to do with is NATO. It's interesting, isn't it? Putin hasn't invaded any of the other eastern states where NATO, where those states join NATO. The only one he invaded was Ukraine, not a member of NATO. You have to stand up to a bully. So you, tr you trust him? Putin? Putin? Of course no, not. No, no. It's just, a, just, just the most appalling uh, dictator that we've seen in our lifetime. Thank you, Pac. Stay with me. Uh, coming up next, how young is too young to learn about transgender identity and sex? Is four too young? I would say that is too young. We'll debate that after the break. This is Talk TV. Welcome back to Facebook on Census. Still to come tonight, Burberry's Valentine's Day advert is accused of glamorising mastectomies. Should brands be activists like this or distinct to selling handbags? We'll debate that later. But first, she's been nicknamed Christian Mum. Izzy Montague launched legal action in 2019 against her son's London school over an LGBT pride parade. Tomorrow, her case goes to court. It's the first case of its kind in the UK. She will claim a pride parade held at the school promoted gay lifestyles and indoctrinated children, and her child was four at the time. It's a debate raging on both sides of the Atlantic. In the US, 78% of parents do not believe sexual orientation or gender identity should be taught to young children. And now Donald Trump has, of course, 
uh, got involved and said it's going to be a central part of his bid to return to the White House, branding gender ideology a cult. We're going to stop the left-wing radical racists and perverts who are trying to indoctrinate our youth, and we're going to get their Marxist hands off of our children. We're going to defeat the cult of gender ideology and reaffirm that God created two genders called men and women. Well, Ava, I can feel bristling to my side here. <laughs> Joined also by uh, Paula and Adrian, who's also bristling. Richard Tyus, I don't know, probably nodding away. Also with me now is LGBT rights campaigner Peter Tatchell and the Fox News contributor Tommy Lehrer. Well, welcome to a stellar panel, I've got to say, for this. Uh, all right. Uh, Tommy Lehrer, let me start with you, because it's been a big burning issue in America now, raging away for quite some time. It's one of the reasons, I think, that Ron DeSantis, the governor of Florida, has seen such surging popularity, potentially heading him uh, to the White House uh, in this battle over what you can teach at school with young people in relation to this kind of thing. What is your view? Listen, we do not need to be teaching this radical LGBT grooming agenda in schools. It's one thing if parents want to do that on their own time, that is a parent's right to do that with some exceptions, of course. But to bring this in and bake this into a public school curriculum is wrong. And meanwhile, Chinese students are learning quantum physics and we've got our students learning how to twerk from drag queens. It's not going to end well. This is grooming. This is ideological mind control. It's introducing this to a group of individuals especially to young kids who have no business learning any of this sexually explicit material. This is not about being anti-gay or as the incorrectly labeled Ron DeSantis' bill, don't say gay. This is about keeping this out of the classroom because it does not belong there. This is a grooming agenda. It is extreme. It is explicit. It does not belong in front of young children at their school. They should be learning reading, writing, and arithmetic, not this filth. Well, but I think you've made your position quite clear there, Ms. Lehrer. Uh, I, I imagine, Peter Tatchell, you agree with every word of that? Well, here in Britain, we know from research that nearly half of all lesbian, gay, bisexual and transgender pupils in our schools have been bullied. Bullied, teased, some, sometimes subjected to physical violence simply because of their sexuality or their gender identity. So this education in British schools is designed to combat bullying and to promote understanding and acceptance. None of the teaching in British schools is sexually explicit, nor is any of the material in United States schools. Uh, it is all about promoting understanding and tolerance. So what's just been said is a complete misrepresentation of the teaching. And I think that any parent would want their child to be brought up in a school where understanding and acceptance of difference is valued where people are not bullied because of their sexuality. Okay, here's what I would say to that, Peter. I, look, I, I don't disagree with some of what you just said. I think the issue here is age. I've, had, I've got four kids. You've all gone through, obviously, all this. I just think the idea that at four, any child should be exposed to anything like this is ridiculous. I really do. They're just nowhere near old enough to, uh, to understand or even begin to understand any of the stuff that this is being taught in this way. So although this woman in this court case did this on religious grounds, um, she's a Catholic and this is what her, you know, she believes her religion has taught her to, to believe, that's one debate. But actually the wider debate for me is what age should we be teaching kids about things like gender identity and should they be compelled to go on pride parades and so on at the age of four? I don't think so. No one is compelling any child to go on a pride parade anywhere, not in school, not in the street, nowhere. And when it comes to teaching, the teaching is not about sex at a young age, it's about relationships and the fact that some kids will be in uh, married heterosexual families, some will be in single families, some will be in extended families and some will be in same-sex families. It's all about different families that kids in our schools are part of. And of course, all those kids should feel loved and appreciated. The essence of this teaching is about love and respect for other people. It's not, it's not about sex at all. OK, let's bring in the panel here. Paula? Good evening. 
I completely agree with Peter, and I'm really concerned that uh, a commentator could use the words radical and grooming when we're having a very sensible conversation about helping children to understand who they are. What well, they... 70, as we saw that poll, 78% of Americans would share a lot of the views that Tommy Lehren expressed there. They do not want to see kids age four getting bombarded with this kind of ideology at school. But what kind of ideology? What exactly are we talking about? And if you listen to Peter, well, he we're explains talking, it okay, very I'll give, an I'll give an example. When you start teaching kids... I mean, the BBC, for example, had a, one of their teaching videos said there were over 100 genders. The BBC should not be teaching children there are 100 genders. One of them was astrogender, which is an affinity with the stars. Right, the ones flying I, around the moon. I, 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 I'm, right, so, so I'm I sorry, I, I, I do actually think that children should not be exposed to that kind of clapter. Well, I don't, I don't can, can we let, the curriculum, can we let but children I doubt be that children? Particularly well, at that, that age. Mean, Come on, th there's Richard, a, there's, they're growing no, up in households. No, there's an age, there's an appropriate let their families, hang on, hang on, let their families have the there conversations are millions of they feel they should have. Who them. are desperately concerned about what is being taught in primary school. And the truth is, we don't know what's but being you taught. Have just for heard far too about the high percentage of children who suffer bullying, who are vulnerable, but, where that's, safeguarding that's about, is that's about, very th relevant that's about to their teaching and empathy. That's got nothing to do with gender ideology. You don't need to teach a pride parade. That's what this is. About. Because it's not the, about it, being proud to be gay. No, it's about being teach, proud to you be can you. Teach, right. yeah. 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 To be tolerance and understanding, but not at four, five, six, seven. Fine. I don't hear We actually do do that. Aside tolerant. from all of this, we actually teach sex quite explicitly in heterosexual relationships from a really young age. You actually have children in nativity plays where you're playing a mother who has an immaculate conception and then gives birth to a baby. What are you teaching about? And you're how talking do they about. Sex. If you've ever, as exactly. I have done four times, had kids who've appeared in these things, they yeah. thought they haven't got a Scooby Doo. What any of that? Well, means. I grew yeah. up Catholic, right. and, and no I knew one's what teaching. Sex was from no a very young age. Well, I'm sure you did. But <laughs> what, what's the purpose of that story? The purpose of that story is love. Yes. The purpose of that that's story fine. is bringing that's people fine. together. That's and that's what the four-year-old is being taught. Well, I want to bring. I want to bring back Tommy Lehren here because we've had a really scandalous case in the last few days, Tommy, here in the UK of a transgender person uh, who committed two rapes when identifying as a man, rapes of women, uh, and before the, co the court case started, it had transitioned to become a woman and then was tried under a female name. And then when, when he was convicted, this person, I'm using that term deliberately, I think, because I, I'm unconvinced by this transition process, when this person was then convicted, brought in a law which allowed uh, this trans person to then be put into a woman's prison as a woman who had literally got a penis and raped two women. So that not only were they being punished by being put into a place where they could attack other women, but they were being treated as if they were legitimately exactly the same as a woman born to a female biological body. What do you make of that? Piers, you're wrong. You're, you're wrong. Yeah, this Piers, is a problem that we are encountering. Okay, in the Peter, US. I'll, Peter, I'll come to you. You can correct me. Was, well, Peter, Peter, you can correct was, me. All right. Well, she, get a, hang on. Let's go to Peter first. She, correct, me, correct me on what I said that was wrong. She was put in. She was put into a woman's prison, but in a segregation unit mm -hmm. where she had no contact with other women. But she and shouldn't have been put in there right. at all. A rapist must never. A, a rapist should never have contact or be a potential risk to other women. Mm -hmm. She's now been moved to a male prison, quite rightly, uh, and again, she will have no contact with women. Why do you say, so she's been, why do you say she say has been moved to a male prison quite rightly, though? Because that immediately, to me, sounds incredibly confusing. You're saying she, so you presumably think that she is a woman, and yet she has been moved to a male prison because nobody else actually now thinks she is actually a woman. She's a man with a penis who raped two women. I mean, that's the reality. Even her ex, or well, his or her or person, she, whatever, their ex-wife said that this is all a complete scam to game the system and get into a softer prison. Well, I think you're probably right. I think it does look like the person is gaming the system. But, you know, the fact is that the transfer to a woman's prison was not based on any new law introduced by the Scottish Government. Mm -hmm. It was based on existing policy, which was to respect a person's gender identity, but not, under any circumstances, put someone who'd committed crimes against women in contact with other women, and that's why she was in 
a segregation unit. Yeah, I mean, look, I, I, I don't think I, what I said was wrong, because by, so new I'm... Law, I mean, by new law, I meant this is a law that's come in in recent years, which allowed that gender identity to be enforced in the way that it was enforced. And I, Tommy Lehrer, I just have a massive problem with people... This is what I've been saying from the start about this trans debate. The moment, the moment you open the door to this kind of abuse by people, it will happen. You know, it's a bit like cheating in sport. Once you allow it, everyone starts right. to cheat, right? You're going to get a load of people who, you know, male rapists, male sex offenders, what's utopia for them if they get convicted? Mm -hmm. Being taken from a men's prison with their pariahs and put into a woman's prison surrounded by people they can attack. Over 200 yeah, so I want to be very clear about this. Not everybody who is transgender does something like this. My turn to talk. Not everybody who is transgender is going to do something like this. But you are opening the door for this. And even beyond that, well, we're not even talking about a women's or a men's prison. Let's just talk about here in the USA, and I know in the UK as well, when they're having biological men compete in women's sports, using the same locker rooms, exposing themselves to the female athletes that are often in high school. It's inappropriate. It doesn't belong in schools. It doesn't belong in society. This free for all you can identify as anything. You can abuse the system. You can abuse this whole notion of gender identity. It's gone too far. And to even criticize it now has been labeled bigotry. It's not. It's reality. Okay. We need to protect people. We need to especially protect young people. Well, I, I actually agree with all that. Uh, Peter Tatchell, I mean, I know, I've been watching some interviews you've been doing. I do think you've been, you know, on a, a mission of discovery yourself about the perils here of this, particularly in this case in Scotland of this rapist. But if I was to ask you now a question which has become the most dangerous, controversial question in the world for some reason, you know, what is a woman to you? A trans woman is a woman, but not the same as biological women. There's a difference between biological sex and gender identity. Both are equally valid, both equally deserve respect and equal rights. There should not be a competition between biological women and trans women. They both suffer from very elevated levels of domestic violence, sexual assault, including rape. That applies to both trans women and other women as well. So let's find the common ground rather than fighting each other. The enemy is misogyny. That's the enemy, not trans women. Well, I think the enemy is misogyny in many ways, but I think the enemy is also virtue signalling because the idea that you can let trans women who have massively superior physical bodies compete in professional sport against women born to female inferior physical bodies, I think is for the birds. Um, but we will... Actually, that's an unfortunate turn of phrase. Uh, no offence to anyone who's offended by my use of the word birds. Um, but thank you very much, Peter Tatchell. Great to have you on the programme. Thank you, Tommy Lehrer. Great to see you. Uh, you're packed. You're staying with me. Because after the break, we're going to talk about Burberry going massively woke. I'll talk to the neuroscientists accusing them of glamorising breast removal.
Well, welcome back. Luxury brand Burberry is launched a new campaign, which has little to do with selling clothes, but does sell an ideology. It features gender-neutral models, one of whom appears to be a post-operative trans man bearing scars on their chest from a double mastectomy. Well, my pack's still with me, and I'm joined by Dr. Deborah So, who's a neuroscientist, and best-selling author of The End of Gender. Well, welcome to you, Dr. So. Your thoughts on this Burberry campaign? Well, hi, Piers. Thank you so much for having me. Well, with this campaign, I have to say, we can't really say what Burberry's intentions were, but I am very concerned about this larger trend of non-binary or of young women getting double mastectomies, presumably not for health conditions, but rather for an aesthetic or because they like to live as a gender that is in between male or female or neither male or female. There's no such thing as being non-binary or gender neutral. There are two genders, two sexes. I discuss the science of this in my book, The End of Gender, as you mentioned. And I am very concerned because in many cases, these young women have other psychological issues. They have a history of sexual trauma. In some cases, they are on the autism spectrum. They are lesbian and not comfortable with their sexuality. Or in some cases, they've gone through puberty and they're just not fully comfortable in their new, more womanly body, which is completely normal. And I would say every single woman on this planet has had that experience of being uncomfortable in her body at some point in time, especially considering society and the way that society tends to sexualize women, especially post-puberty. These are all things that we should be talking about, and especially for young women, we should be giving them that support. They should be getting a proper psychological assessment before they are deciding on surgery. And so I, I can't believe that we are now saying that as a society, yes, young women, if you are at all uncomfortable in your bodies, go ahead and, and, and cut off healthy tissue. Right. I mean, look, it's a, it's a powerful statement about this. I just don't know, Richard, what are Burberry doing getting into any of this anyway? It just seems to me the ultra extreme end of the virtue signaling woke world where who's this appealing to? It's a tiny, tiny number of people. I don't know. I just look. It's a fashion it's, company, aren't they? Yeah. And, and I just thought the, the picture was awful, horrible. What's the, what's the appeal I of that? I don't think you're the audience. I'm not being rude. No, <laughs> I can't imagine who is, who is who is the who audience? Well, I, I, think it's, I think it's a beautiful piece of art, actually. And I think it's high culture. And I think what? it's fashion. I think it's exciting. It's pushing boundaries. It's what, really? scars on it's, a body? I, I think exciting. It's, Paul, yes, do you I agree? Think it I don't, actually. actually. I think... I think Wow, we're just splitting the woke. <laughs> we do. Well, for a start, it's not woke. This is nothing to do with being yeah. woke. Well, it is actually. And it, and it all comes down it, to what it I isn't. Call it's nothing signal. about being awakened to an issue. This is about fashion. Yeah, but when this I was young, about... Burberry used to just basically sell clothes and they used on size yeah. two models, regular ways on, to do on it. Who size looked like two they were on heroin, yes. who looked like they was I don't on, agree with that either. On, on, uh, you know, on drugs or, or, or whatever it is, is this... alcoholics. We are looking at the fashion industry as if they are some kind of moral code. Yeah. They are not, they never have been, they never will be. This is about Burberry attempting to be a little bit controversial to and, get us and... all talking and when really what they're doing is they're making well, vulnerable me, right. people right. placed in a dangerous situation. I'm going to can avoid you, the temptation to go to our fashion that? expert, Richard Tyson. <laughs> final, <laughs> final word to, to Deborah. We've just got a few, a few seconds left, but your final word after hearing the little debate there. Well, when you look at the scientific research at the moment in terms of how clinicians are being advised, it really is uh, what the patient wants. So the patient wants to take a bit of hormone here, a little bit there, remove this body part, add this body part in order to live by this so-called non-binary aesthetic. That is exactly what they should advise. And also from a scientific okay. perspective, detransition tends to happen four years post-transition, so we'll see what Dr. happens so, at the end. Sad. We've run out of time. Thank you. I appreciate it. That's all for good stuff.